history, apologetics, and current events. From the housetops, coming up next. Now I'd like to introduce our guest speaker. He's a graduate of WPI. He has an undergraduate degree in mechanical and nuclear engineering and graduate degrees in mechanical engineering and business administration. He is registered by the state of Massachusetts as a professional engineer. After working at nuclear power plants at Raytheon, he purchased and operated a metal fabrication business, Merchants Fabrication. In 2014, he ran for governor in Massachusetts as the only pro-life candidate on the Republican primary ballot. We also know him personally. His faith is very integral to everything he does. I present you Mark Fisher. Thank you, Brother Thomas. To the members of the Mecca Hard Mary High School graduating class of 2022, congratulations. And to all those who have served you on your journey, parents, faculty, all the members of this wonderful religious community, clergy, and all your known and unknown benefactors, well done. At this time of the year, there are so many commencement exercises. The graduating classes assemble, assemble, adorned in cap and gown, and with shoes shined, awake to receive their prize diplomas. They have passed all their quizzes and exams. They have handed in all their papers. However, however, before they are allowed to receive their diplomas, they must undergo and pass one final exam. In all these very different commencement exercises, this final exam is remarkably the same for all of them. It consists of this. As students are addressed by speakers who talk way too long, can they appear interested and not fall asleep? If you pass that exam, then you can receive your diplomas. You are commencing something today. But up to now, and for the most part of your lives, you have been instructed, formed, guided, coached, tutored, led, lectured, commanded, directed, trained, taught. And as such, you are rightly considered educated. After all of this, you might be tempted, tempted, to think that you know it all. I am fairly sure that your parents, and I am absolutely sure that any younger siblings will agree with me when I say, resist that temptation. With all your training and education, you are about to begin. Begin what? There are so many paths ahead. Work military service, further education, a religious vocation. No matter which path you believe God is calling you to follow, remember the words of St. Augustine, love and do as you will. The path you choose is important. How you walk in that path is equally so. Your commencing is about using what you've been trained in, you all remember long ago the day when the training wheels came on. Today, a much larger set of training wheels comes off. If you choose a natural path, it'll be one in the world. But it is a world quite different from that centered here at IHM. And therein lies your challenge. The 
world in which you enter has rejected the God who made it. And you dare to enter it without training wheels. The wonderful truths you've learned, the good examples you've been given, and the most beautiful experience of knowing, loving, and serving the God who made us is what the world desperately needs. And you are among the ones God has chosen to participate in the great mission of going out into the world to tell of his great love for us. God's plan for his church, in the words of St. Cardinal Newman, is to bring about the world's conversion. It is the great mandate of our Lord himself when he said at his ascension, Go and teach all men. Is one church of which we are so grateful to be members has received his promise to be led into all truth. The church is the guardian of these truths, or as the scriptures say, the church is the ground and pillar of truth. In the past, the church both believed and taught these truths. Sadly, today, there has been a whole scale abandonment of believing and teaching these truths. Of course, present company excluded. Even truth itself is challenged at so-called Catholic colleges and universities. But God, in his loving wisdom, has placed you here in these turbulent times. It was not his plan for you to be born in other times. But now, God has equipped you for these times, and he has done so by those who have served him in providing for your education. Now, he asks you to serve him in whatever path you choose. Surely, you all hope one day to serve him in heaven. You are not now called to serve him in the church glorious or in the church suffering. God's role for you now is in his church militant. The boot camp of your lives up to now is over. You commence active duty in the church militant. Today, your name on the active duty roster is being called. How will you answer? Just a very short way up the road at St. Anne's, there's a group of altar servers who gather for the monthly meetings. When attendance is called and each name is read aloud from the roster, the altar servers do not respond by saying, here, or present. They respond, ready to serve. You are entering a world that is not ashamed of boldly exclaiming, I will not serve. The godless world is not afraid of expounding its beliefs far and wide, through all the media, and in every form of communication. If your senses are not guarded, they will be overwhelmed through billboards, videos, plays, books, audios, and bumper stickers. Lies and shameful, prideful lives go unchallenged by the church whose very mission it is to tell the truth, to call us to repentance, that we may love the God who made us. The church at large will not have your backs as you enter this world. Your mission will be behind enemy lines. If ever there was a mission impossible, this is it. It is daunting, it is formidable, it might be intimidating. It is certainly not for the faint of heart. I said that the church at large will not have your backs. That deserves a bit of explanation. During the Arian crisis of the 4th century, it is estimated that 97% of the bishops denied the divinity of our Lord. The faithful and most wonderful saints of the time 
had to fight for the faith. But their battles took place within the church. Likewise, your biggest battles will be fought within the church. The saints of those early days knew that the church, despite her many human evils, was, as the scriptures tell us, the bride of Christ. Our Lord's marriage with the church is for good times and for bad, in sickness and in health. Our Lord gave himself up for the church. When the church, who should love him in return, doesn't, our Lord doesn't cut and run. He stands by her and waits for her return. He has only one spouse. He is no bigamist. He is no polygamist. He is faithful forever to the one for whom he shed his most precious blood. We'll be back with more from the housetops after this break. Hi, this is Elena Rodriguez with EWTN. You're listening to WQPH 89.3 FM, Shirley Fitchburg. So we have another reading from Maureen's Capistrano's book, Heaven's Helper, My Little Star. Lisa, thank you for joining us. What message have you and Teresa picked out? Lighten your load. Could you read that, please? Has anyone ever made it Jesus? He replied, yes, my mother. I realized that Jesus was asking all of us to see his mother as a role model. He was encouraging all of us to follow her example and not give up. He said, if we didn't know, I would make it. He would not have chosen me. I asked Jesus if I would have healing gifts, and he said I would have to earn this through full and complete faith. I asked him when I would have full faith, and he promised that it would be soon. I asked him why he could not just give me healing gifts as I felt that I was ready. He showed me that I was still struggling between the material and spiritual world. Beautiful. Mm. Teresa, do you have a comment on that? Why did you choose that reading? I chose that one because number one, forgiveness to totally surrender to Jesus, not to have anything, anything standing in the way. That's the only way he can work with us. Total surrender, total forgiveness, and imitate his mother because she did that. Thank you. So if you don't have the book, you can get it on Amazon, Heaven's Helper, My Little Star. Thank you, ladies. Hello, this is Father Frank Pavone of Priests for Life. Are you committed to pray every day for an end to abortion? I invite you to join the Priests for Life National Prayer Campaign. If you visit priestsforlife.org, you'll be able to sign up and download the Prayer to End Abortion that we invite every believer to pray daily. You can find the prayer in English and Spanish. This interdenominational prayer does not simply ask God to end abortion, but expresses your individual commitment to speak and work in defense of the unborn. Remember, not only can they not speak, but they cannot even pray. They are the most defenseless human beings. We must stand in the gap. Prayer is the foundation of everything we do in the pro-life movement. Please join this national prayer campaign at priestsforlife.org. This is Father Frank Pavone, National Director of Priests for Life. When Our Lady appeared to the children of Fatima, one of the things she said to them every time she appeared is, I want you to come here on the 13th of each month. So I like to promote our candlelight processions at the Shrine of Our Lady of Fatima in Brighton on the 13th of each month from May through October at 8 p.m. We have Father Ed Riley, who's coming, who's a chaplain of the World Apostle of Fatima and a regular at the Shrine. So please join us, 8 p.m. 155 Washington Street, Brighton. Hello, this is Kendra Von Esch. Faith and patience. Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. When I waver in my faith, when I question my trust in you and your plans, please come to my aid. When I'm impatient and want my prayers answered, or your plans to unfold on my time, please remind me that patience is a virtue that I must exercise. Lord, I believe, please grant me the grace of more faith 
and more patience every single moment of every day. For more inspiration, go to KendraVonEsch.com. Hello, this is Father Frank Pavone of Priests for Life. This weekend we observe Father's Day. We thank God for faithful fathers who, like God himself, give and protect life. Let's also pray for fathers who are afraid to be fathers. Thousands of times a day, children are aborted, not because of a choice of the mother, but because of the choice of a father who fails to show the faithfulness and willingness to protect the child he has helped conceive. At other times, fathers try to stop the abortion, but the law excludes them from the final decision about the abortion. Men do suffer grief after the abortion of their child. Healing programs are available for these fathers. Let's pray for all fathers. When their child is unexpected, may they welcome that child and encourage the child's mother to say yes to life. This is Father Frank Lavone, National Director of Priests for Life. Hi, my name is Christine McWilliams. I live in Lemonster, and I love listening to WQPH Radio. And so while the church at large today may be like that in the 4th century and will not have your backs, the church faithfully will always stand by our Lord and support you in remaining faithful as well. There are three things to be remembered for your mission to be successful. First, reality trumps appearances. So many want to appear to be kind, nice, good, loving. We know that one of the most devious attacks of our enemy is to appear as an angel of light. Our Lord was betrayed to the appearance of charity, a brotherly kiss. The world's avoidance of reality leaves in its wake shattered, broken, sad, and almost hopeless lives. Don't be afraid of showing it the happiness of lives lived in the real world created by God. Number two, be joyful in the good, the true, and the beautiful. Our blessed Lord tells us to be of good cheer and to let our light shine before men and not to hide our light, but to put it on a lampstand for all to see. St. Peter tells us to get a reason for our hope. Everyone loves a joyful person. Remember all that God has done for us, be joyful in it, and see how God uses that draw others to him through your good and joyful example. Number three, address the biggest enemy first. In the great spiritual combat on which you are embarking, you must be ruthless and unremitting in your attack on your biggest enemy. He stalks you He longs for you to fall. He encourages you to be lazy, proud, unmannered, slipshod, crude, vulgar, disrespectful, slanderous, detracting, greedy, envious, unwilling to sacrifice, unwilling to serve. He hears every word you say. And you hear him. He sees you. And you see him every time you glance in the mirror. Our greatest enemy is our fallen selves. Before we conquer the world for God, it is probably best that we start with ourselves. Before we see all that's wrong with the world, let's tackle all that's wrong with us. When with God's grace, we become charitable, and we learn from him to be meek and humble of heart, then we'll be fit to win others for Christ. Our Lord has told us that by our love we will be known as his followers. It was said of the early Christians, 
see how they loved one another. They conquered the pagan world in which they lived. Let's follow their example. It's true that you have an impossible mission, and that it is not for the faint of heart. But it is for saints. Strive to be saints. Near the very end of the book of the Apocalypse, there is a list of those who will not enter heaven. It is not surprising to find among this list murderers, liars, sorcerers, idolaters, and the like. But at the beginning of the list, ahead of all the others, are mentioned the fearful, cowards. Cowards do not go to heaven. It brings to mind the story of the servant who hid his talent in the ground because he was fearful. Saints were many things, but none of them were fearful. They may well have had a fear of themselves, but this was no match for their trust in God. I'll close with an example of a saint who was your age, yet she lacked your education. She claimed to not know A from B. She was unbelievably fearless in doing God's will despite the greatest hardships. Hers was a mission impossible. St. Joan of Arc was no coward. She had to convince those who should have been with her from the very beginning. Her many and spectacular military victories were not accomplished in one fell swoop. In most of her military campaigns, she was unsuccessful in her initial and secondary assaults. She received serious wounds and had to be carried from the battlefield. But she was no coward. She was a saint. She returned to the assault and was victorious. She chastised the military leaders for their unwillingness to fight. Let her example be yours. Commence the battle. Engage the enemy. When you fall, rouse yourselves and return to the assault. Let the trust of yourselves be outdone by your trust in God. Be happy warriors for the God who loves you so much. And may the good and gracious God, who has commenced this good work in you, bring it to fulfillment. Dr. Paul Lavin, a traditional Catholic psychologist, summarizes in vivid detail the challenges young Catholics must face today. In his book, Keeping the Faith, A Young Catholic's Guide to Coping with a Secular World, Dr. Lavin identifies the enemy, Satan, and his increasing influence in the world. He wrote this 66-page manual specifically for the young practicing Catholic student who will soon be leaving home and entering the world. The author also suggests that keeping the faith is a perfect tool for parents and teachers in their efforts to direct and guide the young people whom God has placed under their care. You can receive a free copy of Keeping the Faith, A Young Catholic's Guide to Coping with a Secular World by contacting info at saintbenedict.com. That's info at s-a-i-n-t benedict b-e-n-e-d-i-c-t dot com. The Liturgical Year by Abbot Garanger. In the Gospel of St. John, chapter 6, we read these words of our Lord, My flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh, and drinketh my blood, abideth in me, and I in him. As the living Father hath sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, the same also shall live by me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. He that eateth this bread shall live forever. The beloved disciple could not remain silent on the mystery of love. 
But at the time when he wrote his gospel, the institution of the Eucharist had been sufficiently recorded by the three evangelists who had preceded him and also by the apostle of the Gentiles. Instead, therefore, of repeating what these had written, he completed it by relating the solemn promise made by Jesus on the banks of Lake Tiberias a year before the Last Supper. Our Lord was surrounded by thousands who were in admiration at his having miraculously multiplied the loaves and the fishes. Jesus takes the opportunity of telling them that he himself is the true bread come down from heaven, which, unlike the manna given to their fathers by Moses, could preserve man from death. Life is the best of all gifts, as death is the worst of all evils. Life exists in God, as in its source. He alone can give it to whom he pleases and restore it to him who has lost it. Man who was created in grace lost his life when he sinned and incurred death. But God so loved the world as to send it, lost as it was, his Son with the mission of restoring man to life. True God of true God, light of light, the only begotten Son is likewise true life of true life by nature. And as the Father enlightens them that are in darkness by this Son, who is his light, so likewise he gives life to them that are dead, and he gives it to them in this same Son, who is his living image. The word of God then came amongst men that they might have life, and abundant life. And whereas it is the property of food to increase and maintain life, therefore did he become our food, which is come down from heaven, partaking of the life eternal which he has in the Father's bosom, the flesh of the word communicates this same life to them that eat it. Now just as two pieces of wax melted together by the fire make but one, so are we and Christ made one by our partaking of his body and blood. This life, therefore, which resides in the flesh of the word, shall be no more overcome by death. On the day appointed, this life will throw off the chains of the old enemy and will triumph over corruption, and these are bodies, making them immortal. So it is that the church, with her delicate feelings as bride and mother, selects from this passage of St. John her gospel for the daily mass of the dead, thus drying up the tears of the living who are mourning over their departed friends and consoling them by bringing them into the presence of the Holy Eucharist, which is the source of true life and the center of all our hopes. Thus, not only was the soul to be renewed by her contact with the Word, but even the body, earthly and material as it is, was to share in its way in what our Savior called the Spirit that giveth life. From the House Stops is produced by the slaves of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, Still River, Massachusetts.